Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Coreedathon edition of Lindy's Magpie Reads. So, Coreedathon is uh, a week long event, March 7th to the 13th, encouraging people to read Korean books and celebrate Korean culture, food, music, movies, that kind of thing. And the two booktubers who are sponsoring this are uh, Monica Kim and Chloe of Books with Chloe. I'll link their channels in the description. And I'm so glad that they're doing this because I had a great time. Um, I read six Korean books in this past week and I've got um, a lot of food things to talk about. Um, so one of the great things about focusing on a country um, in a short period of time is that there's all these correspondences um, between books and it ends up with, you know, the sum being greater than the parts. It was a really rich experience for me. I had a lot of fun. So thank you, Monica and Chloe. They've been doing... Um, uh, live episodes. I watched one with uh, the author Francis Cha who wrote If I Had Your Face. That was great. Um, they've done one with June Her. Uh, I've read a couple of her books and uh, I'm sure it'll be fun to watch after the fact even though I missed it while it was live. Um, when I was watching the one the the live program with Frances Cha, she said that she has a picture book coming out next summer um, based on a fable, I think. Anyway, it's called The Goblin Twins, and I'm really looking forward to that. So, what did I read? Um, this is also a fable, Moon Pops, uh, and it's by... Hina Beck, who is a very well-known illustrator uh, in Korea, but this is the only book of hers so far that's been translated to English. Uh, Hina Beck won the Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award in 2020, so I imagine that she will be having more things um, coming out in English. That award honors um, outstanding contribution to children's literature. And uh, so the, the type of art that she did for this particular book um, is this huge diorama. And I'm going to link to a short video of her talking about her art because you can see this diorama is about as big, <laughs> it's almost as tall as she is. Um, it is a, an apartment where you can see in through the windows on a hot, hot night. I'll show you some of the images on screen instead of trying to show you the book because it's not gonna come up good in the video anyway, so I'll pop those in here. Uh, so <laughs> basically the moon is melting on a hot, hot night and everybody's using electricity and the power goes out and um, someone who has collected these drops of moon, moon drops makes um, some ice cold uh, frozen treats for everybody. Uh, but then... Um, Someone comes knocking on the door. Who can that be now? <laughs> and for me, cue men at work music. <laughs> anyway, it's the, it's the rabbits from the moon. So that's the part I think that connects to a traditional uh, Korean fable. Actually, it's also told in China, various versions, I think in Japan as well, with the rabbits in the moon pounding their rice for rice cakes. Anyway, uh, this book is great, <laughs> lots of fun. And it's, it's so cool to look at the um, exquisite work that she did with lighting and just creating all of the characters for this story. Um, 
Another picture book that I read is The Turtle Ship. So you can read that. Which is also using collage illustration. And this one is written by Helena Kuri and um, illustrated by Colleen Kong Savage. So it is based on a historic figure, the Admiral Yi Sun Shin, and he apparently designed um, a, a special kind of warship they called the Turtle Ship. And this story uh, is a picture book for kids. Oh, <laughs> cat, <laughs> Frida. <laughs> uh, and it reimagines uh, his life as a child and his pet turtle and um, how his turtle inspired him to create this. Uh, the collage in here uses papers from around the world. Um, There's such gorgeous texture. I loved looking through this book. In addition to being a good story about um, how children can make a valuable contribution to society. Um, there is also, uh, you know, the artwork in it that's fantastic. And one of the papers is um, a Korean handmade paper, a traditional paper that's made from the inner bark of a, a tree that's kind of like a mulberry, I think. Then I read a couple of graphic nonfiction, and the first one is Grass. The author is um, Kyun Suk Jendri Kim, and this was translated by Janet Hong. Uh, it is a, a difficult book in the set emotionally difficult. Uh, journalist uh, Kim Suk Jendri Kim interviewed Granny Lee Oksun, who was a comfort woman. So uh, she was one of the many women who were held as sexual slaves for the Japanese Imperial Army. And uh, the art has all of these, this thick black ink, um, lots of smudgy marks, uh, and it really conveys the trauma that these women went through. Uh, but she also intersperses a lot of um, images of plant life, trees, grasses, flowers, and it, it gives the spirit a break, I found, um, you know, as I was reading through it. Um, yeah, a nice soothing element. And I also really liked how the author showed her technique of interviewing in a way, like she showed her traveling to this um, old age home where um, Lee Oksun lives now. And it's a special home for women who were um, comfort women. And, you know, so they have this shared history. Uh, it, I highly recommend this book. It won um, a Harvey Award for Best International Graphic Book and at least three other prizes as well. Um, I just think it's an outstanding portrayal of oppression and dealing with trauma. Next, there's Palimpsest. And um, this is by a Korean-Swedish author, uh, Lisa Ulim Ublum. And it was translated by 
uh, Hannah Strumberg, and also the author, and the author's husband, Richie Wyver. Hublom's situation is that she was adopted at two years old um, from Korea to Sweden, and she had great Swedish adoptive parents, uh, but her uh, experience growing up in a, in a small town in Sweden is that there weren't very many people who looked like her. She did have a best friend who was also a Korean adoptee. So in the 70s and 80s, uh, there was a, a lot of babies and young children who were adopted from Korea. And as Hublom got older, she... <laughs> You know, she got it to be more curious about her first parents. Um, so when she was pregnant with her first child, she's in her mid-twenties by this point, um, her doctor asked her about her mother's pregnancy because it could affect, uh, you know, that she would have a similar medical situation. And she knew nothing, of course. And she did try when she was 17 to find information about her um, first family and was told there was nothing. Um, there was no way to track them down. Um, but 10 years later, she did uh, persevere. And so most of this book is about that. Uh, and, and what she uncovered was a whole um, adoption industry. You know, the dark side of adoption, especially, I guess, transnational adoptions, where uh, people made a lot of money uh, and supposed orphans weren't necessarily orphans. So uh, um, I'm not gonna tell you what she found out, but I will say that she's now a, um, an adoption adoptee advocate uh, and activist. And this is a fascinating fascinating story. Um, in her first visit to Korea, when she was tracking down information, um, one of the things that really struck her was how everywhere she went, people were so helpful and friendly. Um, they were eager to spoil her children with treats and affection and attention and she realized that this was really unusual um, from in her experience because in Sweden the strangers were treating her as intruders and um, and they would even come up to say demeaning things to her um, and she said that in Sweden our guard was always up shoulders raised here we can finally relax and just exist. On her last day in Korea, her host there makes bibimbap, um, and that's the author's favorite food, and it happens to be mine too. Next, I read this novel, Winter in Sokcho, by Lisa Shua du Sapin, and it's translated from French by Anissa Abbas Higgins, and this won the National Book Award for Translated Fiction. It is told in first person in the voice of a woman who's um, an outsider in this town where she grew up, Sokcho, which is way up in the northeast of South Korea. It's quite close to the North Korean border. And um, she never knew her father, who was French, uh, and because she's of mixed ethnicity, she is treated like an outsider in the, you know, in her hometown. Um, you know, people talk to her in English, for example, instead of Korean. And um, she works in this really shabby guest house. And it's winter, it's a beach town, so it's off season. Um, it actually gets so cold one night that uh, some of the pipes freeze. 
but there aren't very many guests. So one of the guests is a woman from Seoul who's had um, a cosmetic surgery. So her face is all bandaged up and she's just there, you know, recovering from the surgery, which made me think of Frances Cha and her book, If I Had Your Face. Uh, but the most important guest of the story is this uh, comics artist who is from France. And he and this narrator, this woman, um, go to different places together, like the, the uh, demilitarization zone. That's another example of cross-pollinization with these, these other books because um, Lisa in Palimpsest also travels there, so I'll show you an image of that from Palimpsest. And the woman's mother is a fishmonger. I'm going to show you another image from Palimpsest uh, of them going to a fish market. It's not the fish market in Sokcho. This one is in Busan. But the woman in this story starts um, having romantic feelings towards the comics artist and she's finding that he's using her to help him interpret what he's seeing as he visits Korea and she really wants him to be seeing her. Uh, it's a very poignant story, evocative, haunting, with an ambiguous ending. I thought it was great. I really liked it. Um, one of the passages in here um, relates to fables. So since I read a couple of fables this week, I thought I'd read you this passage. Uh, and this is between the Frenchman and the narrator. Fables aren't happy stories, I said. They can be. All the ones from Korea are sad. So the final book that I'm going to talk about is a cookbook, The Korean Vegan, and it is by Joanne Lee Molinaro. And I'm just going to have a sip of my boricha here. This is some um, cold roasted barley tea, which I normally make in the summer and keep a jug of it in the fridge. But in honor of Koreadathon, I got out the boricha and <laughs> I made some. Uh, so I had never heard of Molinaro before. I had to find out about her. She is a Korean American attorney born in Chicago, but she has uh, a really popular TikTok um, channel and YouTube channel. I'm going to link to a video of her preparing uh, tteokguk, which is um, traditionally eaten on New Year's Day. Um, and in that video, she's also getting dressed in hanbok, which is a uh, traditional Korean clothing and there's a voiceover where she's reciting a poem what is it called when you fall in love and in that poem I recognized a scene um, that she talks about in her book the Korean vegan uh, a scene between Joanne and her mother the video is only two and a half minutes long and <laughs> it's beautiful so uh, Obviously, many other people have heard of her. Um, she's got 613,000 subscribers, including me now. <laughs> and um, back to the cross-pollination, tteokguk is one of the dishes that um, is prepared in winter in Sokcho. And um, there is another element in Korean vegan. Oh yeah, where she talks about her mother's radish soup being a cure-all 
and in winter in Sokcho, the narrator offers to make radish soup for this French guy. This is the kind of cookbook that has a lot of really interesting um, sort of memoir type information in it, as well as interesting headnotes. So even though I didn't make anything from this cookbook, I really enjoyed reading it. Um, so she talks about why she stopped eating meat um, and how that decision affected her feeling of Koreanness, um, you know, her identity, because of so many special dishes, you know, that are made for, for special occasions that are made with meat, like um, bulgogi. So she has a recipe in there for one that uses soy curls for that. Um, barbecue short ribs, and that's called galbi and um, she uses mushrooms in that dish. Um, there's a, a spicy, crunchy garlic wings, uh, which is really complicated. Um, you use extra firm tofu, you freeze it, thaw it, squeeze out the liquid, then refreeze it, thaw it, squeeze out more liquid. Um, you also use canned jackfruit in that, and um, to burdock roots, which she says, if you can't get those, substitute parsnip root, which I'm a little not sure about. <laughs> I mean, I have had burdock before, and I know that it's got that kind of earthy, a tiny bit of bitterness and sweetness that maybe you haven't, yeah, I guess in parsnips too, but it's the um, texture that I'm not sure about. Anyway, so this spicy, crunchy, Garlic Wings also uses a, a half cup of potato starch. It's deep fried. You, you know, do lots of shaping. Um, it's just so complicated, so much work. I would never attempt it. There is a simpler, um, sort of similar flavored dish called Spicy Crunchy Tofu. That one's pan sauteed. Uh, with a block of taf tofu and a half cup of potato starch and then it's the you know the sauce that makes all the difference in that but yeah all this potato starch that she uses um, that's that's not my kind of cooking I'm vegetarian too and often vegan but um, um, I'm just not interested in attempting those kinds of dishes that use so much starch. Uh, I loved what she had to say about bibimbap, uh, which means mixed rice. Um, as I mentioned, that's one of my favorite Korean dishes. And she says it's just rice, leftover banchan, those are side dishes, um, and sauce to bind it all together. So I was like, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> Instead of having to you know, wait till I go to a Korean restaurant to have bibimbap. I'll just make my own version. And um, so here's my riff on bibimbap. Um, I love that, you know, she talks about how you just use what you have. Um, so with, uh, you know, a kimchi um, bokkeumbap is basically kimchi fried rice two ingredients that all well, Korean cooks tend to have on hand. Um, this Koreatathon inspired me to make kimchi. Um, I've made kimchi quite often before, but it's been about a year the last time since the last time I made kimchi. Um, I went to um, TNT, a Chinese grocery store, with my neighbor and got some Napa cabbage. Uh, I cut it up, salted it, and then I went to prepare the um, the paste mixture that you mix in. Um, with, I had all the minced garlic, chopped up the ginger, and then I got out my package of gochugaru, which is the Korean pepper flakes, and it had gone moldy. <laughs> and I was not going back to 
the Asian grocery store, which is quite a trip for me. I don't have a vehicle. Um, so I thought, okay, use what you have. And then I looked into what could I substitute. Um, I have uh, gochujang, which is a red pepper paste. But from everything I could find on the internet, it doesn't make a satisfactory replacement when you're making kimchi because of the other ingredients that are in gochujang. Um, I've got peri-peri chilies from Portugal. I thought, well, that would, you know, give the spiciness. But the flavor is different, definitely the color is different. I have paprika, but in the end, I decided to just make white kimchi. So it's basically like sauerkraut, except it's flavored with garlic and ginger. So I made this on Monday and I put it down in my cold storage uh, cupboard in the basement. We have kind of like a pantry that's not insulated. And I brought it upstairs on Thursday and there weren't very many bubbles yet. And I realized that because we've still got quite cold weather, it was I think like minus 15 at night, um, it's just too chilly in there. It needed a bit more warmth to ferment. So now I've got it on the counter and this morning I could see more little bubbles. I tasted it and yeah, it's coming along with it's, um, it's white kimchi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, what else about this cookbook? Well, both of her parents were born in North Korea and then her and then they traveled uh, as you know, refugees with the author's grandparents into South Korea. They were evacuated. And um, so that, you know, that has many um, uh, uh, sort of heartbreaking stories. Her mother almost died of starvation uh, when she was a year old. Um, Her, her parents, her grandparents were at the point where they thought that they would have to drown her, um, their one-year-old, because she was going to die of starvation and they didn't want her to suffer anymore. Um, so, you know, they, they were going from house to house begging for food. And one of the things she says in this book is, like many of her generation, my Halmoni, her grandmother, grew up a rice kernel away from starvation. And um, this is a situation also for the women in grass after the um, Japanese army left uh, at the end of the war. Um, these women then were still struggling and starving. I, I'm really glad that I found this cookbook. I, and I actually found it by going into the library catalog and typing in the word Korean and what's available now at my library. And so this digital edition of this cookbook was available. I'm going to show you just one more image from the cookbook because it has beautiful photos in it. And this one is for sweet maple roasted corn tea, which I had never heard of before. And to make it, you roast corn kernels um, and the cobs and the silk from the corn to start with. Um, there are many steps. Anyway, then eventually you serve it with sliced lemons and sliced jalapenos. So very interesting. There's some sweets in here that are made with persimmons, with red beans in chocolate chip cookies, um, sweets made with jujubes, um, with sweet potatoes. Uh, there's a, a lasagna recipe that's given a Korean flavor with gochujang in the in the red sauce. And because it's vegan, oh, there's complicated layers. There's um, uh, sort of an avocado bechamel sauce. There's tofu ricotta. 
there's uh, a mushroom filling, um, you roast tomatoes, you roast uh, zucchini. Um, I'm sure it's delicious, but a lot of work. <laughs> I'm into the simple stuff. So, uh, all, of, all of this immersion in thinking about food from Korea and from Asia, and also because three years ago I was in Japan enjoying um, these beautiful soups for breakfast. That's what I made for myself for breakfast this morning. Not a Korean soup. Um, it's a miso soup with um, some lemon juice in it. And um, instead of gochujang, I put in um, harissa. Um, so um, I guess sort of a hot and sour soup with green beans and some leftover mixed cooked vegetables. And it was yummy. And I hope you have yummy stuff to eat today, too. There are two books on the International Booker Long List that are from Korea. Cursed Bunny by Bora Chung and Love in the Big City by Sang Young Park. And both of those are translated by Anton Hur. And I want to read both of them. And... There's another booktuber that I follow that is participating in Koreadathon. That's Katya of Read, Write, Create. Um, if anybody else who's watching my channel is participating, um, please let me know and I'll go and watch your videos too because I'm all enthusiastic about books from Korea now. All right, I think that's everything. <laughs> Thanks for watching and bye.